Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining in from whichever part of the world you are in. I am Siddharth Biswas, and on behalf of Dun & Bradstreet South Asia Middle East Limited, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for taking out time and joining today's webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you all to DNB. As you all know, DNB is a US multinational established in 1841 and having presence in over 200 locations across the globe. I'm happy to share that we are the pioneer in the credit information business. And currently, we own the world's largest commercial database of 350 million business entities. Talking about DB Same, which is done in Bradstreet, South Asia, Middle East, we are having the regional headquarters in Dubai, UAE. We have been in the region since 2004, and we are catering to 65 markets across the South Asia, Middle East, and Africa region. Without further delay, I know we are, you know, we were supposed to start at five, but we are, it's five past five. So without further delay, I would like to welcome all of you once again in today's webinar titled 50 Years of Altman Z Score. What have we learned? The speaker for today is none other than Professor Edward Altman. As you all know, he is the creator of the Altman Z Score for predicting bankruptcy. Altman Z Score is also, you'll be interested to know, it is quite interesting to know that Altman Z Score is accessed over 5,000 times every day on Bloomberg terminals across the world. Dr. Altman has an international reputation as an expert on corporate bankruptcy, high yield bonds, distressed debt, and credit risk analysis. He is the editor of the Handbook of Corporate Finance and the Handbook of Financial Markets and Institutions and the author of a number of books, including his most recent works on bankruptcy, credit risk, and high yield junk bonds, recovery risk, corporate financial distress, and bankruptcy, and managing credit risk. He is also an emeritus and Max Lee Hein Professor of Finance at New York University's Stern School of Business. So welcome with this, I would like to welcome Professor. Welcome Professor. Thanks for your time today. We are very fortunate to have you today as a speaker, and we look forward to hearing your insights on 50 years of Z-score and COVID-19 and the credit cycle. Just a few guidelines before I turn it over to Professor. Um, I'm glad to share with all of you today that we have over 500 participants joining in this webinar today from over 30 countries and across different time zones. All the participants during the webinar will be kept on mute by default. Should you have any questions during the presentation, you may please type it in the, uh, in the question and answer uh, tab, which is there in, your, in the Zoom app. We shall take up the questions during the question and answer session after the presentation. Also, uh, I would like to share that the presentation, which will be shared by Professor in today's webinar, uh, will be shared with everyone after the webinar. And last but not the least, please note that this webinar is being recorded. With this, I would like to hand it over to Professor, and I would like to welcome all of you once again for joining in today's webinar. Thank you so much. Professor, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid, and good morning, everyone. At least good morning here from Long Island, New York. <clears throat> Great pleasure and honor to be with you today, and I'd like to thank Dun & Bradstreet uh, for inviting me to work with you today. I've known D&B for many, many years. In fact, many years ago, I don't even remember how many, maybe it's at least 30. Uh, I had the distinct honor of introducing the CEO of Dun & Bradstreet at that time, 
uh, to receive some big award in New York. And that was uh, my first direct inter interaction with the company. Of course, being in the credit business, I've known DNB uh, for most of my life, <laughs> actually. Today, my plan is to speak with you, as the title implies, about two main issues. First, to take you through 50 years plus of Z-scores and to see what we've learned over those years. And so we're going to do that in less than 50 minutes. So please fasten your safety belts as we go through this. Uh, at the end, I'll also provide some thoughts about COVID-19 and the credit cycle. Now, this actually is a subject I've been following very, very closely ever since uh, last uh, March. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, I provided a paper to uh, an article that I wrote on this subject to DNB, and um, I think it will be available to you as well as the recording of this event. So those are the two main topics for today. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Next slide, please. Yeah, and Professor, before we, we, before we just move on, I think yeah. you know, we got some interest or we some, got some questions from our client before the webinar. So they wanted to know that what is this Altman Z-score and why the Altman Z-score has been accessed over 5,000 times every day on the Bloomberg terminals across the world. And the second question they have is, what have you learned from Altman Z-score in the 50 years since you came up with it? And how has it evolved over the years? Very good questions and one that I will cover in depth. In yeah. fact, let me say a few words about uh, the, the fact that it is still around after 50 years. Well, I am perhaps more surprised than anyone that an econometric, a, a statistical model that was built more than 50 years ago when I started doing my research in the area of bankruptcy prediction is still around and in fact more popular today than ever before. And I think there are three main reasons for that before I go into the actual building of that model. First, it's relatively simple to understand, to apply, and to uh, then work with. Two, it's still quite accurate. We estimate that we can predict accurately bankruptcies within two years with about 80 to 90% accuracy. That's what we call type one accuracy, where you predict bankruptcy correctly. And this has been the case for over the years. But now since the credit markets are so more developed and large and leveraged, there's so much more interest in it. But interestingly enough, Sid, there's also great interest on the part of equity investors, people who are investing in equities of companies. And the third reason, besides being simple and accurate, is it's free. You don't have to pay for it. And something that's free will be tried by people. And if they like it, they keep it. If they don't like it, they'll try something else. Or indeed, they may try something else anyway. But the point is that it is still quite popular and um, even more so. And I've never, I, I, I'm perhaps the most surprised about that. Uh, now let's take you through uh, the development of it. What was it like doing empirical research on corporations in the so-called Stone Age more than 50 years ago when I was a PhD student at UCLA. Well, I was very, very fortunate with respect to the timing of my PhD work. There was then the introduction of mainframe computers on college campuses like UCLA where I was there. And this made it possible to harness data to apply rigorous statistical analysis to what was known then and still is as traditional financial statement analysis. And there were statistical software programs available to do classification analytics. 
let me tell you what it was like to do uh, empirical research back then using uh, data and uh, software programs to process that data. Well, in those days, you had something called punch cards. Now, most of you are too young to know what a punch card is. Uh, Sid is too young, for example. But many, maybe some of you out there have gray hair and uh, you, you remember what a punch card is. Anyway, you had to punch the data onto these cards, combine it with the source program. The boxes became quite heavy. You had to pick those boxes up, go across the campus to the mainframe computer, submit the job, and pray that you would get results. And maybe half the time you wouldn't because there were problems with the data punching or the cards were a little bent. Anyway, it was a challenge compared to the current situation where everything is done on your personal computer or even your smartphone to do this analysis. Databases. Well, at those times, there were no databases, electronic ones that you could go to like there are now. Many of the um, uh, vendors out there are providing data on companies and macroeconomics, microeconomics, um, bond ratings, etc. In those days, what there were were these big tomes from Moody's, Standard and Poor's, and other vendors who were selling their data through books, essentially. And you had to gather the data by hand type it onto these punch cards and do your analysis. I was very, very lucky with the timing. First, there were these uh, mainframe computers to assist me. And second, there were these programs, uh, discriminant analysis was the one I used, but regression analysis that were now available to you. I'm convinced, Sid, that if I was a student two years before, I wouldn't have been able to do the Z-score model. And two years after, someone else would have done it by then. So timing is really important. Let me tell you something about the original model called Z-score. And I want you to, uh, everyone to concentrate very much on the specifics of the sample and how you should apply it. One of the things of my objective today is to show you the proper way of applying the Z-score and the way that it has been done sometimes improperly and causing some problems for me and others over the years, although people are still using the Z-score in the old traditional way as well. First, only manufacturing firms were used in the sample. Therefore, the original Z-score is most accurate on manufacturing companies. As a result, I have built other models, which I will show you, for non-manufacturers, everything except for financial institutions. The size of the sample was relatively small then, only 33 firms in a bankrupt and non-bankrupt group. They were only publicly owned companies, so therefore the data was available because private companies were not available then, and to this day in the United States, very difficult to get data on private companies, uh, good data to build and to test your models. And the control non-bankrupt sample were matched by year of the bankruptcy, size of the firm, and industrial sector. There were relatively small firms back then in the mid-1960s. In fact, big firms didn't go bankrupt then. Let me tell you, today, big firms go bankrupt and quite a bit. Just as a preview of coming attractions, so far in the United States, through the middle of August of this year, there have been 45 companies in the United States, 45 that have gone bankrupt with more than $1 billion of liabilities. I call them mega bankruptcies. And we will probably break the all time record this year of these mega bankruptcies. Um, the original model was built on publicly owned company data. Uh, 
And so over the years, I've built models for privately owned as well. At the end of my talk today, I will also mention some new work in the area mm -hmm. of small and medium-sized firm models for credit risk analytics. Okay, back in 1967, 68, when I published my first, we had a so-called cutoff score methodology. I'll show you that more clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, do not use those original cutoff scores. 1.8 was the cutoff score then. And then it was a binary classification analysis. Either the firm is likely to go bankrupt or not within two years. Now we move on to exactly how to apply the model. Next slide, please. Sid, next slide. Okay, uh, so I did this uh, research in 1966, uh, completed dissertation in 67, published in the General Finance in 68. In 1977, we had an article on Zeta scores, which was a second generation model built for both manufacturers and non-manufacturers, but that was a proprietary model, so you cannot use it. Probability of default estimation. Let me mention this very carefully. The original model, and the one that is most popular, classifies a company as bankrupt or non-bankrupt. Since then, I've learned that what's very important is probability of default, probability of bankruptcy. And so in 1989, we published something called the mortality rate approach, dealing with cumulative default, cumulative loss distributions from the birth of the bond in that case, and using bond rating equivalents. I will show you this more carefully. Then in 1995, we built a model for emerging market countries, which was very similar to the Z score, but it did not have a market value element to it. And it was published when I was a uh, consultant to Solomon Brothers. Uh, and finally, uh, my emphasis is more on SMEs today and with uh, some uh, work in Italy, uh, we built models for uh, Italian mini bond issuers. These are small and medium sized companies issuing bonds directly to the public. And that has specific models since for our different countries and sectors using three types of data. And I'll get back to that at the end very quickly, financial data, artificial intelligence and macroeconomic data all combined into a scoring model. Next slide, please. So here's the classic um, bond rating equivalents that uh, bond ratings, and I'm going to use these bond ratings in order to estimate the probability of default by going from a score to a bond rating equivalent and then a probability of default. By the way, that bottom part of the market is a market that was fairly unique to the United States. Now it's spreading in other countries like Europe and uh, Asia. But those are the so-called high yield or junk bonds below investment grade, double B plus and lower in the S&P and Fitch uh, nomenclature. And I've spent a lot of my time studying this market. And although it is, doesn't exist in most of the countries that you are um, representing, and I understand there's more than 30 countries out there uh, in terms of participants, um, it is very big and important market. And after all, since it's the most risky part of the height of the corporate bond market, it's the market that produces, so to speak, the most defaults. And that's how we gauge where we are in the credit cycle. Next slide, please. So here's the classic original Z-score model. Some of you have studied this before. If you are a CFA, you have to study it as part of the level two exam. And so uh, the model has been exposed a lot that way. Five financial variables, all derived from either balance sheet or income statement with a weighting factor for each representing X1, uh, liquidity of a company, X2 is a retained earnings to total assets, 
a measure of the solvency of the company, the historic earnings of the company, uh, minus its dividends paid out relative to the size. Third variable is a standard profitability variable, EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes to assets. The fourth variable was quite unique. We were the first back in the 1960s to harness the information content of market values of companies. Of course, this model of, is um, uh, relegated to analysis only of companies that are publicly traded. And that's why we develop models for private firms as well. And finally, sales to total assets, which is a, a variable that was helpful originally, but since I've discarded in some of the newer models. Next slide. The accuracy of that model, well, in the laboratory was quite good. 94% accuracy within one year <clears throat> and 72% uh, within two years. That second year uh, accuracy actually has improved quite a bit over the years. Uh, in holdout samples, that is observations not used to build a model, the accuracy actually was slightly better, which surprised me. And over the years, in terms of predictive sample, consistently the accuracies are over 80% within one year of the bankruptcy and between 68 and 75% two years prior. So the accuracy has retained its um, fairly high level over the years. Originally, we established a 1.81 cutoff. Next slide, please. This shows, by the way, the um, size of the high yield junk bond market in the US. You can see it's close to $2 trillion today, outstanding. When I got involved in the very beginning in the left-hand side as a consultant to Morgan Stanley at that time, they were interested in 1981, 82, whether they should get involved in this highly profitable, but highly risky and high return market. Next slide. Okay, this is very important now. The original Z score model had these cutoff scores. So 1.81 was a score that most people and some many, many still use. Any firm above 1.8 was considered not to go bankrupt and below 1.8 was to go bankrupt. If you look at this slide, it shows you the median or average and median company by bond rating from the highest bond ratings, AAA, AA, down to the D rated, which is when they default. Notice that in 2017, the average score for a B rated bond, which is the most common high yield bond, is 1.65. Um, you can show that, Sid, with a, uh, an arrow there in the, in the left hand corner. Left hand, yeah, that's it. 1.65. That's below the 1.81 original cutoff score. But it's the most common high yield bond. And I estimate that about 28% of B rated bonds default within five years, not 100%, not even 50%. And so over the years, I've decided not to deal with the cutoff scores. And that's what I recommend you not deal with it. What I recommend is bond rating equivalents. Even if the firm is not publicly traded, does not have public bonds outstanding, small companies, medium, large. But if they did have a bond, this is what their bond rating equivalent could be using the Z score. So for example, a firm with a score of three looks like a triple B, the lowest of the investment grade. And a score of zero is consistent with a defaulted company. So zero is a much better cutoff score today than uh, it was back uh, then when it was 1.8. So I wanna caution everybody about that, even though to this day, many people who've read the original article, but nothing since that I've written, still use 1.8. Next slide. How you go from a score 
to estimating a probability of default and a probability of loss if you are a creditor. <clears throat> there are two methods. I like the first method more than the second, but the second is also quite good. First, you get a credit score from an existing model on the debt outstanding of the company. Then, as I showed you, you have a bond rating equivalent of that score. So now you can have an international language of credit. You don't have to have anybody really know what a score of two or four or six means by itself. But if you then associate it with a bond rating, you have an idea of the hierarchy of credit risk. And then utilize this technique called mortality rates to estimate marginal and cumulative default probabilities. And then by factoring in recovery rates, if there is a default, we can estimate probability of loss. The bottom methods, method two, is using a technique called logistic regression, which I leave for some of you who are more statistically inclined. That's where you can build a model like Z-score. But instead of ending up with a bankrupt or non-bankrupt classification, you end up with a score between zero and one, which is like a probability between zero and one of going bankrupt. And based on these PDs, you then assign a rating to a company. Here's the uh, actual formula for those of you who are interested for uh, uh, estimating the marginal mortality rate and the cumulative mortality rate. I won't bore you with equations today, but let me just mention that these are the same type of equations that an insurance actuary uses when they estimate the life expectancy of people. We are in the business of estimating the life expectancy of a credit, whether it be a bond, a loan, um, a uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, all the type of things that many of you as bankers out there or corporates use on a regular basis. So from these uh, equations that are uh, actuarial based, we can now calculate a Z uh, 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 probability of default matrix. Next slide. Okay, so this is the mortality rate table, originally built in 1989. I've updated it every year since. And so this data in this table, this matrix represents more than 3,500 defaults in the corporate bond market. And the incidence of default based on the original rating on the left-hand side of this matrix and from one to 10 years afterwards. In other words, you can look at the marginal rate and estimate what it would be one year, two year, three years afterwards. And then the summation of the marginals and with a little bit of different calculation, you can get a cumulative. So let's take an example of the B rated bond again. That again is the most common junk bond has a 2.82% probability of default in the first year, relatively small. But then you can see starts increasing in the second year, third year. Um, and after five years has a cumulative probability of around 28%. Double Bs have about a 10% cumulative. And then if you go higher into the bond ratings, you can see their probability of defaults are much lower. And even triple A's can default within five years, by the way. So this gives the analyst the ability to observe the original rating, if it is a bond, or if it is a loan having a, a, an assigned rating from the credit score, and the historic incidence of default, again, in the bond markets in the United States. I can tell you, this resonates very well with insurance companies that have big portfolios of fixed income securities. It resonates also with equity investors. 
because you know that if you're an equity investor and it goes bankrupt or defaults, you're probably going to be wiped out. It resonates with bankers because they have to estimate reserves for losses and reserves for write-offs. And so this table has become very important. Next slide. This shows you the same data, only factoring in recoveries. A recovery is, for example, if you own a bond or a loan and you can sell it when it defaults, what you get back is a recovery. Or if you're a banker, the recovery is usually calculated at the end of the restructuring period or the liquidation period. What you get back if you liquidate the assets of the company and you're a creditor, or if you sell your security, if it's an outstanding debt. So for example, that 28% in the fifth year becomes 19.6% loss in the fifth year for single Bs in the center. Now, that means that you can expect to lose about 20% of your portfolio if you invest in a portfolio of Bs by the fifth year. But you've been receiving very high coupons and interest payments for five years. And it turns out from a risk return standpoint, it's quite favorable, even a B rated bond. I wouldn't say so much about triple C's where the expected loss is over 35% after five years. Next slide. Let's show a few examples. Now, there's a very big retailer that recently went bankrupt in 2018 called Sears Roebuck. Notice there are two scores on this. One is the original Z score, the blue line. And in 2016, had a score of about 1.3 and at a B minus bond rating equivalent. But the Z double prime score, the one that I'm going to get to in a moment, which is more appropriate for retailers, showed a D rating, bond rating equivalent in 2016, almost two years before the firm actually went bankrupt. And you could see that is more appropriate, that model, which I'll show you, for non-manufacturers. And I recommend you use that. So let's go to that model now. Here it is. This is the, uh, sorry, this is the Z prime model. This is if your firm is publicly owned, but you, sorry, is privately owned, but you want to apply the original Z model for a manufacturing company. And notice we use book value of equity in the fourth variable. So that's a model that you can look up in some of my writings, uh, including our latest book uh, that describes it. Next slide. Okay, this is the Z double prime score model developed in 1995. Notice four variables. We don't use market value because we want it to be applied uh, to all firms globally, including emerging markets. So we substitute book value of equity. Four of the five variables are the same as in Z score. And there's a coefficient of 3.25, which is a, like a y-intercept term. So you apply the model in the same way. You calculate the four variables, multiply it by these coefficients, add the constant term, and you get a Z double prime score. You take that Z double prime score, and then you apply it to a bond rating equivalent, which is in the next slide. Next slide, thank you. So now we can see we have bond rating equivalents for pluses and minuses, much more granular. So the last time we did this was 2013, and you notice that a score above zero is a bond rating equivalent, which is non-default. Around zero, like the Z score, but only this is a Z double prime model, you have um, a firm that uh, is likely to go bankrupt. The others are, um, depending on the level, uh, higher and higher, of course, means uh, more credit worthy companies. But now we can do it more granularly and for all types of companies except for financial companies. Next slide. The accuracy of that Z double prime uh, uh, model 
uh, and um, uh, that model uh, had an accuracy very good, uh, again, in uh, six months before, well over 90%, uh, and 18 months before, on average, in my predictive sample, between 80 and 90%. So these are uh, tried and true models. You know, there's an old saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Or if you're in Italy, the proof of the pasta is in the eating. But uh, in models, the proof of the use of these models is how well it works after you've built the model, not in the laboratory. And that we have uh, had a very good uh, uh, accuracy. Next slide. Now we'll talk about what we have learned besides the application of the model, the cutoff scores, bond rating equivalents, and probability of default. This table, which is very busy, you can look at it at your leisure, shows over the years a number of applications that I or others have told me about for using the Z model. On the left-hand side, these are uh, users of the model from outside the firm. On the right-hand side, these are users of the model from either within the firm or by researchers. Left-hand side, lenders like banks, uh, bond investors. Um, uh, it can be used for Basel capital allocations. You know, on the Basel, your banks are required to have um, uh, 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 reserves of uh, capital for credit risk issues. And so you can di uh, uh, dissect the portfolio that you have using a Z score type model. Most banks in the world, including a lot of the bankers, I'm sure, uh, in the audience today, they have their own internal models. That's fine. If it's, be if it's based on large portfolios, a lot of years of experience. But if you don't have that, and you, or if you'd like to combine what you have with a, a model like the Z-score or um, maybe some other metrics that you use like from Dun & Bradstreet or from others, and you can quantify the probability of default and probability of the loss from that, that's very helpful for the Basel capital allocation. Long short investment strategy on stocks. Believe it or not, Goldman Sachs uses my Z-score model to build baskets of companies of high Z-score and low Z-scores in terms of a long short strategy. And there are a number of other institutions that also use it. Security analysts, regulators. I know there are some regulators in the audience uh, today and regulators can use these kind of models to check the kind of um, uh, portfolio um, decisions and uh, ratings that banks in their jurisdictions are using. So it's kind of a check and balance on the banking, the credibility of the banking models. Auditors, yes, an auditor can use a model to check the probability of default of their own clients. Advisors to the firm, same thing. Merges and acquisition. Finally, on the left-hand side, and we'll get back to that, COVID-19, and particularly the assessment of triple Bs that I've spent some time on. Right-hand side, should a firm file for bankruptcy or not? Well, the Z-score is an indication of how healthy they are. And I'll show you an example with General Motors. Industry sector analysis, maybe you build a separate model for energy companies or for retail companies or for restaurants. Those are probably the three biggest companies uh, sectors this year in defaults. Sovereign default risk assessment. You can assess a country's risk by looking at the health of the private sector in the country. Purchases, suppliers, accounts receivable, researchers like myself, chapter 22 assessment. Yes, you can go bankrupt more than once in the United States or even three times or four times. And what the firm looks like coming out of bankruptcy might be interesting. Finally, managers of companies. You, if you're a corporate out there, can use the model to assess your own strengths and weaknesses. Here's General Motors. Well, General Motors, was well, American icon, was being evaluated for a government bailout back in 2008. And I testified before the US Congress. At that time, 
and back in 2000, December 2008, the bond rating equivalent was a D, default, below zero Z score. I was convinced that GM would go bankrupt, but the US government did not want them to go bankrupt. And in a rare case, they actually bailed them out, but it only worked for a while. And then six months later, on June 1st, 2009, they filed for bankruptcy. It was one of the happiest days of my life, by the way, Sid. And the reason was I had predicted it, and I'm convinced that General Motors is a viable company today because they went bankrupt, not despite that they went bankrupt. Because in bankruptcy, you can reduce your debts dramatically. You can have time to restructure your assets. You can get new financing much more easily than you could when you were out of bankruptcy, so-called debtor in possession financing. Anyway, they came out, they've done fairly well. I still think they look like a B-rated company, but they are now rated triple B by the rating agencies. And so they have survived nicely. They're not out of the woods yet. General Motors and many other auto companies are suffering a lot, particularly in COVID-19. And we'll get back to that. Next slide. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of um, the history of Z-Score and its applications and what have we learned. In the time remaining, I'd like to go quickly through where we are in the credit cycle and COVID-19. Whenever I talk about credit cycle, I look at five financial indicators. Default rates, recovery rates, required returns by investors, something called a distress ratio and liquidity. For example, in 2019, next slide. In 2019, before COVID, we had a relatively low default rate. 2.8%, historic average 3.3%. The recovery rate on corporate bonds was between 40 and 45%, about the historic average. The required rate of return of investors at that time was around 4% premium over the risk-free rate. The historic average is 5.2 for high yield bonds. The distress ratio, the percent of high yield bonds trading more than 10% above the uh, um, risk-free rate was only at 8%. And there was plenty of liquidity. Conclusion, we were in a benign credit cycle. Indeed, the longest in the history of our uh, credit markets in the US. Next slide. After. COVID-19 became evident starting in March of 2020. Things changed dramatically. But the thing I want to point out to everyone is, yes, we've had lots of defaults, lots of bankruptcies, lots of stress in the markets of credit since COVID-19 and its devastating impact on the economy. But coming into COVID-19, the US economy was heavily leveraged and vulnerable to a big downturn, but we didn't know the catalyst. Now, of course, we know what happened, even though we didn't expect it at the end of 2019. Default rates started to rise and lots of downgrades in March and April, some call fallen angels from triple B down to junk level big spike in forecasts of defaults. That's a stress cycle, stress cycle indicator. The recovery rate fell to around 30 cents on the dollar. That's what you could sell your bonds for if they defaulted. That's also an indication of stress. The yield spread premium increased to 11%, much higher than 4% just a few months ago indicating our investors were risk averse and getting very, very nervous. Distress ratio spiked to 15 and then eventually to 
40% of high yield bonds was selling more than 10% above the risk free rate. The historic average, again, was only about 10%. Again, stressed. And liquidity dried up. Conclusion the end of the benign cycle, start of the stress cycle, and an economic recession. Next slide. Since then, and to today, bankruptcies and default rates continue to escalate dramatically. I'll show you some data. Several countries outside the United States have actually had a moratorium on bankruptcies and suspension of interest payments. This has not happened in the United States. We have a more laissez-faire uh, uh, philosophy with respect to bankruptcies and defaults. Although there have been plenty of support from the US government, central banks led by the US Fed provided unprecedented and continuous support via direct loans and direct purchases of the bonds and loans outstanding. Even companies that have been downgraded to junk after March 22nd. Notice I've used the word unintended consequences. Has what the Federal Reserve done in the United States caused a debt bubble? I will come back to that. I had recently a debate on that subject. Are we encouraging rather than discouraging in this COVID-19 pandemic, in this serious recession, too much borrowing? Indeed, what happened was miraculous. Due to the central bank, the Fed's activities in the US and similar activities by central banks in other countries, there was a strong rebound in equity and risky debt markets. The benign credit cycle has returned to those markets. Ironically, very quickly, recovery rate remains, however, quite low. That's a stress cycle indicator. The yield spread premium has dropped to normal levels, around 5% or less premium over the risk-free rate for high yield bonds. Distress ratio has dropped to near historic levels. And there's tons of liquidity. I've never seen anything like the new issue market, at least in the US, in bonds and loans, particularly bonds, since the Fed and the Treasury, uh, the US Congress, uh, started support. We now are in another vulnerable situation where the support is not coming yet because of big differences between our two main political parties. Conclusion, mixed signals of benign and stress in this COVID-19 period. But there's no question companies are vulnerable. Look at this slide. This shows you the blue line, shows you the debt to GDP. In this case, the United States, but you could do this for any country. And the dotted red line shows you the default rate on high yield bonds. Every time we've had a peak in 1991, 01, 02, and 08, 09, in the debt to GDP ratio of non-financial corporates, we had within 12 months a spike and a crisis situation in the corporate debt market. Now, fast forward to the right-hand side, where we are today, we're at a huge new peak in this non-financial corporate debt to GDP. And in the lower right-hand side, we are now beginning to see a big increase in defaults. Not as much as it probably will be by the end of the year. So far through uh, the last 12 months, uh, uh, through June of this year anyway, it's a little under 6%. Uh, where the um, crisis situation would be something like 10, 11, 12%, as we've seen before in those three prior crises. So keep your eye on the default rate in the United States high yield bond market as an indication of whether or not we will remain in a crisis or not.
Now there's no question. We are in a crisis of defaults, but not a crisis in bond prices and equity prices. This has never happened before. Usually when you have a crisis in defaults, you have a crisis in, um, uh, in uh, the credit markets and in the stock market. Next slide. Okay, just show you very quickly, the yellow bars represent recession uh, periods in the United States. And you can see the line graph represents default rates. And every time we've had a recession, especially the last three times, you have a big spike in default rates, but they actually start in some cases before the recession. Fast forward to the right-hand side, we have a new recession starting in February of this year. And we have in the further right, said, yeah. And we have now beginning a spike in the default rate. And everyone expects something like eight to 10% by the end of this year, default rate. And by the end of 2021, because it's not going to stop in 2020, probably more than 20% cumulative for two years or an average of 10% a year. And so that will be right conforming with the prior three recession periods and what happened to default rates. Next slide. Okay, we're almost at the end now. Um, in terms of our forecasting of defaults, I use three techniques, the mortality rate approach, the yield spread approach, and the stress ratio. Basically, they look at historical incidence of defaults given certain market or actuarial techniques. Next slide. This is again that slide on um, mortality rates. So we plug in new issues for the last 10 years by bond rating, and that can give us an estimate of the PDs, probability defaults, and we convert that into dollars to forecast our default rate, just like an insurance actuary forecasts defaults, uh, deaths of people. Uh, next slide. This shows you. Um, an aggregation of many forecasters of what we expect of default rates and uh, in uh, through the next 12 months and uh, through 2021. And you can see most of them, depending on you know the scenarios or the um, best case uh, um, estimate, are somewhere uh, a little less than 10% for this year, the next 12 months, and over 20% for uh, the next two years. Next slide. Okay, I'm almost done. This shows you through July 31st, how many big companies have gone bankrupt. 119 with greater than 100 million liabilities and 43 greater than $1 billion. And if you extrapolate that for the rest of the year, you see the extrapolated totals on the left-hand side, 205, greater than 100 million, that will be the second highest ever. And on the right-hand side, 74 big mega bankruptcies, which will be the all-time highest ever. The leading industries, so to speak, are energy, oil and gas in particular, um, uh, retailers, restaurants, and communication companies. Those are the big four in terms of bankruptcies so far this year. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this quickly. This shows you how you estimate recovery rates. So for example, if you have an 8% uh, default in 2020, these are regression lines that show the correlation or association between defaults and recoveries. Very important that you can estimate recoveries based on how much activity there is on defaults. It's kind of like a supply and demand. So if you go up the slide from 8% to the blue line, for example, that's the linear regression between defaults and recoveries. If you go to the 8% line, Sid, and you go up to the blue line, 8%, you'll see the recovery rate is like 35%. But some of the nonlinear uh, equations, which are more accurate, we have close to 30% recoveries. And so far this year, it's around 32%. Uh, and the numbers on the right-hand side of this graph show you the um, crisis years and how low the recoveries are 
between 25 and 35 cents on the dollar recoveries on bonds. These are bonds. Loans, it's probably between, for crisis years, between 45 and 55 cents on the dollar, maybe even 60 in some years. And so that's very helpful for estimating recoveries. Next slide. Triple Bs. Okay, how do I utilize Z-scores in COVID-19 period? I'm gonna wait and uh, talk about that maybe in the Q&A period, but let me just point out, look at that growth in triple Bs. In 2005, we had about a half a billion, half um, a billion, 500 million outstanding in triple Bs. Today, in 2020, we have around $3.4 trillion of triple Bs. If there's ever been an indication of a huge leverage situation of corporate America, just look at the triple B growth. It's incredible. And now triple Bs, which is the lowest category of investment grade, are about 54% of all investment grade, triple A, double A, and A's, and triple Bs, 54% coming from this area. How we apply it, uh, Z score, perhaps we go to the next slide. We estimated before, Sid, before COVID-19 became apparent, 35% of the triple Bs by the Z score model or the Z double prime look like they deserve a rating of less than triple B. They deserve the junk rating, 35%. Most of the rating agencies would argue that maximum of 10% will be downgraded in a downturn. Next slide. Look what's happened. Some of these names will be familiar to you. Ford Motor Company, Occidental Petroleum, Delta Airlines, Macy's Department Store, Marks and Spencer Department Store, Rolls-Royce down at the bottom, Car Company. These are all companies that have been downgraded from triple B to double B since COVID-19. And if you look at the Z scores and the Z double prime scores, every one of them that was downgraded had a Z score below triple B bond rating equivalent in that Z score BRE column. And most had a Z double prime score below triple B bond rating equivalent. A few had triple Bs in that. So in other words, these companies were vulnerable before COVID-19, and you could have known that with a Z-score type model. Final slide. Some comment on what we're doing today and concentrating on. Uh, yes, uh, I'm still in the, in, the, in the field, so to speak, still in the game of looking at credit models. And we're particularly interested in small and medium-sized firms, which I know is a great concern of many of you out there, especially in countries that do not have many large uh, companies, but small and medium-sized firms are particularly uh, important for those economies, as they are in many countries in Europe and even in the United States, although not as much. Now. Uh, I've been in this game a long time, and uh, we started uh, looking at this SME problem back in the uh, early 2000s, but there were some earlier attempts, and now there are more modern attempts. Um, and one question that can be asked is, if you build a model, say based on many different countries of data, will it be relevant in diverse regions of the world like South Asia? We think they are. And we are doing some work now in India to uh, test that, whether or not uh, you know, our models are uh, accurate there. Um, there is an issue of audited and unaudited financials, especially with small companies. If the data is not very accurate or fraudulent, of course, no model is going to do a good job on that. However, we've added artificial intelligence techniques, particularly social media, natural language uh, identification, governance issues, and the use of macroeconomic data. What's happening in the sector? What's happening in the country? 
what's happening to un un unemployment, what's happening to uh, GDP. And we use those three modules, financials, artificial intelligence, and macro data in some of the models that we are building. And we are looking now to apply these in, uh, on a global basis. We already have some pretty good uh, indications <coughs> coming from Europe. With that, I uh, apologize. I went over a little bit in time, but we started a little uh, later. Uh, I'll be happy to answer some questions. And once again, thank you so much for tuning in today uh, and listening to an old timer talk about something that he's been involved with for most of his adult life. It's been quite a ride. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. I think, uh, you know, thanks once again for taking us through an insightful presentation. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, everyone was, I, I was seeing some questions coming in. It shows that people were listening and uh, they want to know more. Uh, before we move, or, or once I just move on to the question and answer session, uh, the first question that I have, Ed, from my side or from my end is, do you really think is corporate America over leveraged? Well, that's a great question. Um, and of course, there are two, two answers to that. Those who are uh, skeptical about the debt bubble argument or over leveraged argument would say, no, how can you say that? Um, yes, uh, uh, companies are piling on debt, but look at the low interest rates and the fact that they can cover those interest uh, uh, payments with their earnings. Uh, yes, there are many companies that can do that, Sid, but there was a big strata of companies out there. Sometimes we call them zombies. Mm. And the zombies out there are, uh, can be defined in different ways, but basically they're kept alive artificially by banks and uh, uh, other types of creditors. And the reason they're kept alive is the fact that they either are expected to improve their earnings or the banks don't want to write off the loans, which is understandable, particularly in some countries where bank capital is an issue. Uh, my advice is to write off those loans as quickly as you can if you have the capital or, you know, that's, of course, a caveat. However, I believe that we're uh, forming a new debt bubble. And part of the reason is this unprecedented support of the central bank and the U.S. Congress or the Congress uh, legislatures, parliaments in other countries but that's not gonna last forever. That's gonna leave pretty soon, especially if we get COVID-19 under control with a vaccine or it dies out as it did in 1918. But there's no guarantee on the timing of that. But once those protections go away, those companies are on their own. And they built up this debt bubble in a low interest environment, but they'll have to refinance it and the interest environment could be a lot higher or their cash flows won't be sufficient. Hmm. Deutsche Bank has a study out that estimates in the US, almost 20% of listed companies that have been around for more than 10 years have coverage ratios of less than one. That's earnings to interest of less than one for the last three years, almost 20%. Hmm. A lot of those are zombies. And the fact that they've levered up in this period is incredible to me. Mm. The markets have become much too complacent, in my opinion, and it's risk on again. Risk on in a pandemic. I can't believe it. But that's what's happening in the US. I hope it's not happening in other countries mm. because it's going to cause some problems down the line. But the whole idea is now Let's worry about the future later. Let's worry about the present now. Let's get the economy going again and companies getting debt to finance them. I wish they were getting equity if they could. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Thanks for the um, answer. So we have this second question, Ed, coming in from Bangladesh from Mr. Anise Khan. Uh, so the question is as follows. 
given now the uncertainty of natural catastrophes and pandemics, how is it that rating agencies can prepare and retool themselves for the future? And how will they prepare their customers for such uncertainties now that we have a lot of learning on? The new normal from the COVID-19 experience. Yes, great question. Uh, the rating agencies are under some pressure now, no question, because um, while we have had some downgrades, around 200 billion in the triple Bs, um, and there have been downgrades from double B to B and so on, uh, not as much as one would have expected, although the rating agencies are saying they have a new type of, um, uh, Moody's and S&P and Fitch, they have a new type of, um, uh, those are the bigger ones, probably the smaller ones too, a new type of um, analytic called uh, a vulnerable or um, at-risk uh, uh, companies like at the triple B level. And those numbers are at record levels, by the way. There's more vulnerability that they say for future downgrades than ever before. What I think rating agencies can do and that what we are doing in our own analysis is stress testing the financials. Yes, banks are used to stress tests, but what about stress tests on corporates? You can learn a lot by stressing the main assets and liabilities of a company, mm -hmm. given the pandemic, given COVID-19, and assumptions about how long the crisis will last and how long the hit to earnings, profits, cash flows will be to the company. So if I have any advice for, um, for the rating agencies, and you know, I, I by the way, a lot of my ex-students work for rating agencies. I've served on their um, uh, various of them, particularly Standard & Poor's in the past, advisory boards. Uh, that's more, not advisory, that's more of an academic sounding board uh, uh, that I've been on. So I know what they're doing and they're great professionals. However, if there's been a sore spot in the rating agency performance over the years, not just now, it's that they're relatively slow to downgrade. And when they do, they don't downgrade enough, which is maybe understandable given the business model of rating agencies. After all, they get paid by companies and companies don't like to be downgraded. So uh, yes, they, they say they don't, there's not this conflict. Their reputation is at stake and I believe them but it's natural if you're going to downgrade that maybe you don't downgrade it as much as it should be because maybe things will improve. But my analysis shows that models like Z-score will downgrade more quickly and by an appropriate amount rather than late, uh, being delayed and by only a partial amount. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We have the second question coming in from Nigeria. We have uh, Mr. Abraham who has got this question for you. Please give more clarifications on how your constants were derived from the Z-score. Yes. Well, um, they are, I don't know if I call them constants, but yeah, they are specific to that model and they remain the same as long as you apply that model. Um, and that's a great question actually. Should constants remain the same? But first, the question, how we derive them. Well, first of all, I did not determine those coefficients, those constants, those uh, um, uh, weightings. They were determined by a computer program whose objective was to discriminate between healthy and unhealthy companies, between defaults and non-defaults. So that, those, uh, as you call them, constant terms or uh, coefficients are unique to the sample of variables, to the variables that, and the sample of firms that you use to build a model. To the five variables in the Z-score and the firms I used. 
if I built another model today with different firms and different variables, they would be very different constants. And even the same variables would have different coefficients today than they did back then. So that's why I am surprised and very pleased that the old constant terms still seem to be working. But if you build your own model, Abraham, in your bank using my variables, no doubt your constants will be different. Your st statistician guys can tell you using logit analysis or regression analysis or discriminant analysis uh, that it is not the researcher who determines the weightings, it is the statistical program. Thank you. Therefore, very important to have that bond rating equivalent over time based on the scores that come out because that is time dependent. Today's bond rating equivalent will be different than yesterday's. Hmm. Thanks, Ed. Thanks once again. Maybe we'll just take two more questions uh, because we are running out of uh, time. So Ed, the third question comes in from Pakistan. Uh, the use of Altman Z-score is very interesting, accurate and helpful. But what kind of recommendations do you have for countries which do not have available nor reliable data? Mm. Well, if you don't have reliable data, then you cannot build a, easily build a model with that data that's not reliable. You have to look for other data that you, can help you, such as this artificial intelligence uh, technique that I mentioned. There you're looking for uh, data on um, um, the CEO of the company, uh, the experience of management, uh, the location, the number of employees, um, the sector that they're in. Um, but that's not usually going to be enough. Certainly that's helpful. And I know you can get some very good data from Dun & Bradstreet to uh, help build your model, some financial and definitely non-financial data. You know, the history of payments of a company is very important. But I wouldn't, I would not denigrate the quality of your data in Pakistan, for example, as much as you might think. For example, we're finding in India, in our tests, and I don't think it's gonna be that much difference in Pakistan, that the data, while not perfect, has helped us build relatively um, uh, accurate models and models that are robust and models that can be understood by practitioners and by the entrepreneurs themselves. By the way, one of the important benefits of a Z-score type model is that if it becomes known to the small and medium-sized firm itself, the entrepreneur, that they are being evaluated by a certain set of variables. Maybe they don't understand and, no, and they don't have the weightings, those parameters, but they can understand that now they are being evaluated based on the data and uh, that uh, pr provides a performance analysis of the company. Um, and of course, let's test it in Pakistan, for example. Can you see whether or not the Z-score was accurate in predicting some of the big defaults that you've had, or even the small ones? And if it's not accurate, then you need a different model. And I hope the Z-score will be helpful. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Ed, we, uh, we have a question from US coming in uh, from uh, Mr. Anthony Scrifagno. His question is about the impact of hyper disruption and modeling. This is a wonderful longitudinal study. And I noted your mention of AI methods towards the end of your talk. How are you considering the disruption in available data in the context of multiple global disrupting influences? For example, COVID is not happening in isolation. It is happening in the context of political change, trade tensions, et cetera. Uh, 
How do you see AI helping us measure the shifting impact of these disruptions to understand emerging risk and opportunity? Surely we must be able to use some AI methods to begin to study such a question. Yeah, well, this is a great question. Um, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, should not be used in a vacuum. Because as you point out, given political tensions, given um, geographic issues, trade war issues, um, that that could really impact the AI information you're getting. But what AI and, uh, let me emphasize also macro factors can do is add value to an existing financial model. So you start out with the financials and that is blind to most outside influences. It is what it is, and you heard that term before. Uh, and um, then you look for value added. Now, what AI can do is give you information that is real time. It's happening today. Whereas financials are giving you historic data, maybe three months ago or six months ago. Of course, for publicly owned companies, you get financial data from stock prices. That's real time as well. But AI can talk to you about whether or not the CEO of the company is nearing retirement or has announced his retirement or her retirement, whether the CEO of the company has been sued by you know, some outside party, whether the company has been sued, um, their latest information on developing a vaccine. Uh, that will not show up in the financials, but it will show up in the social media. The trick is to convert the social media information into quantitative information that could add value to the financial data that you already have. And that's where you need expertise in the AI use of it through an API model with a, a, a platform that gathers the data and gathers the data from many, many sources, not only social media, but for example, uh, reports of the company uh, itself on governance. And then finally, the macro data. It's very important that you understand that an energy company, when the price of oil is $30 a barrel or $40 a barrel as it is around now, is different than an energy company with the same financials mm -hmm. when it's $60 and $80 a barrel. That's real-time data. It's not AI data, but it's macro data. So what we try to do, and you know, we're, we're, we're learning as we're doing, is combine those three modules, financial, AI, and macro, and look for the value added in terms of a resulting credit score for the company. And then once we get that credit score adjusted for AI and macro, we can look at bond rating equivalence and probability of default. That's what I recommend. You point out a lot of um, factors that are almost impossible to, uh, to include in models if they are unprecedented, like the Fed's activities now, or the political fighting between the Democrats and the Republicans in this election year. Uh, but we do the best we can. Thanks, Ed. Thanks again. We are we are getting too many questions, but unfortunately, we will not be able to take all the questions. Uh, Fed, um, Ed, maybe one last uh, question. It has come in from Saudi Arabia, and I think you have covered this in the presentation. Still, I would uh, ask you this question. It says, COVID-19 has created extraordinary circumstances for borrowers and lenders. What is your Z score saying on what's happening during COVID-19? Okay, well, the first thing we did, and I covered it with respect to the triple Bs. Triple Bs being the lowest of the investment grade, and if they get downgraded to junk, that's a major mm -hmm. hit to the company. So we looked at the, what the Z score was saying about triple Bs, and we combined that with analysis of what the rating agencies were saying at the time. 
And therefore, we are forecasting about $600 billion worth of triple Bs to be downgraded over 2020 and 21. That will add more than one third to the high yield market. How that impacts the default rate will be very important because when you have these big triple B companies becoming junk, could they be crowding out the zombies and the lower quality companies that are also going to be fighting for new financing and liquidity issues um, in this pandemic and afterwards? And we think that the amount of defaults will increase because of the triple Bs entering and how much the triple Bs enter are you, we using Z scores. The other thing we could do is look at the so-called zombies and how many of them look like they're going to go bankrupt. And if I was a credit manager, I would like to uh, um, focus on how many in my portfolio of companies, suppose I have a corporate or a bank and I've got a lot of um, um, companies that haven't covered their interest in the last couple of years, or there's some other category, they have Z scores, they're triple Cs, but they have uh, Z scores below zero. I wanna concentrate on what will that do to my portfolio? And so here's where Z score can be helpful uh, in this. And we look at zombies and how many of the zombies look like they're going bankrupt to the Z score model, even though they're triple Cs or single Bs. Uh, these are all ways of doing it. Um, take a look at my recent book. We talk about this quite a bit um, and uh, it's called Corporate Financial Distress Restructuring and Bankruptcy, just published in 2019 with Edith Hotchkiss and Wei Wang. And I think you'll find a lot of these applications discussed there. Thank you all very much for your questions. I'm sorry, it looks like there's lots of chat there, almost a hundred, many of them, and I thank you for that, are thanking me. And I'm also thanking that 260 or 70 of you are still listening after this old professor has been talking for a long time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Uh, but Ed, I have a request for you. And this is a very interesting question. This will be the last question. <laughs> and after, the, after that, I will not, not ask you any more questions. So we have a question from India. So, and even I wanted to know this. So the question is why and how did doctor name it as Z score? How did what? How did, why and how did doctor name it as Z score? Dr. Nimick? I'm, I'm sure. No, no, no. Uh, they are saying that why did you name it as a Z score? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. that's a great question. Why did I call it Z score? Well, I wish I had a sexy story for you, a real good story, but I don't. Um, uh, I was uh, thinking I, uh, I was calling it A score for my name, but that would be too presumptuous. Uh, and so I said, okay, if it's not going to be A, then why not Z? the last letter of our alphabet. I know it's not the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So, uh, and also Z turns out to be a very important statistic in the field of statistics. There's something called a Z test or Z ratio. And uh, so I uh, put those two together uh, and I came up with Z score. Then I had to call something else, Z double prime, Z single prime, Zeta. Uh, and then finally, I did some work for a, a, a big accounting company. Unfortunately, they went bankrupt themselves due to some fraud problems. You probably remember Arthur Anderson. And anyway, the question was, what do we call the internal model? We were building them a, a kind of an audit risk model. And that one we called A-score. But that was a proprietary model for their company. And so um, maybe I should have called it A-score way back in more than 50 years ago, but I called it Z uh, or Z. And, um, you know, there are other theory Zs out there, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm very, very pleased and humbled 
by the fact that so many people, they don't know me necessarily, but they know the term, the name Z-score. They've heard of that. And that, you know, is very satisfying to me, even if I didn't call it a score <laughs> to, start, to start with. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. So thank you, everyone. We had an in insightful session, Ed. And I would like to thank one and all for attending today's webinar and making it a successful one. As discussed or as informed to all of you uh, just before the start of the presentation, we are going to share a copy of the presentation with, with all the participants. And I wish all of you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ed. Bye-bye.